Welcome to PyData Global 2021. Uh, my name is Basu, and I'm very happy to be here and to be your host for this session. Today, we have quite a stellar array of speakers for this workshop. Um, but I would like to remind you that they would like to have the Q&A session towards the end. So I would like to now welcome Dr. James A. Bednar, Adrian Troy. Okay, welcome to the Python dashboarding shootout and showdown. Uh, I'm James Bednar. I'm the Director of Technical Services at Anaconda. And basically what that means is that I run a bunch of consulting projects with different external organizations. Uh, so that's my actual job. But more relevant today is that I'm a founding member of two groups that um, uh, me and several colleagues set up called Holobiz and PyBiz. And these are groups not controlled by Anaconda. They're independent of Anaconda. Um, and the main hat that I'm going to be wearing today is as PyBiz. And PyBiz is an organization that is just trying to promote Python data visualization of all types, of so any, any library, any dashboarding tool, as we talked about today, anything that helps people get their work done in, um, in Python. So for the, for the large part, I'm going to have my PyBiz hat on. But I have to acknowledge that I'm also a member of Holobiz, and Holobiz is uh, one of the tools today uh, that we'll talk about uh, called Panel is a Holobiz tool. And so uh, just be aware of my biases and background, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, but from here, in, unless I'm saying otherwise, I'm here speaking in terms of PyBiz, presenting the Python Biz ecosystem and organizing this workshop to help people learn more about Python Biz tools and uh, uh, dashboarding tools in this case. So this particular workshop is about high-level Python dashboarding tools. And uh, we had a little discussion in Slack is what is dashboarding? Should we call these dashboarding? Another, uh, another uh, term that's thrown around is web app. Another is analytics app, sometimes ML app or data app. Um, basically all of these tools have in common that they'll let you write some Python and then uh, put something that someone can, uh, is, is not you, can view in a web browser. And this particular workshop is focused on high level tools. There are much lower level tools. Uh, for instance, Panel is built on top of Bokeh and you can completely use Bokeh to build web apps directly. But this workshop is not about Bokeh, it's about the higher level tools. Uh, you can also build um, such tools with Flask or Fast API, or you can build entire websites with like shopping carts if you want with Django. This, talk, this workshop is also not about that. It's about people who've been able to do something in Python and are ready to share it with someone, usually something involving data. And it's also not about developing apps directly in HTML and JavaScript. Obviously, you can always do that, but this is a workshop for Python programmers. So uh, you'll be hearing from four different um, tools today, and they're listed here in chronological order. And I'll try, just try to give you a little bit of background about these tools and where they come from. Um, uh, first off, you'll hear from uh, hear about uh, Plotly Dash that was released in 2017, which is very popular. Here, these numbers are a combination of the Conda and PIP downloads over the previous month. Um, uh, next, you'll hear from Panel again. That's uh, that started in Anaconda. It's not run by Anaconda. It's uh, it's run by this separate organization. So, in fact, the person who'll be defending it or presenting it is not from Anaconda. Uh, that was released uh, later. It's, it looks like only one year, but I think it's more like two years, almost two years. Um, and then uh, you'll hear from uh, Voila, uh, uh, sponsored by, but I don't know if it, you would say it's controlled by. You'll probably hear more about that. Uh, uh, QuantStack came around a little bit later, not much. Um, and then Streamlit uh, is a company called Streamlit. And uh, don't pay too much attention to these download numbers. For instance, Voila is primarily a server that you combine with other things. And a lot of panel users, for instance, don't necessarily use a server. So the fraction of those that use the server might be similar to Voila. So just take with a grain of salt and really just try to remember these are all popular packages. A lot of people are using them. These are not some obscure uh, side package. You'll be hearing from uh, leaders in the field. And who will you be hearing from? So for Plotly, uh, that'll be the first talk. Um, they're from Nicholas Christian, uh, VP of product at Plotly.com. 
panel, uh, panel that is primarily a work of my colleague, uh, Philip Rudiger. It, it's his brainchild and he uh, stewards it. Uh, he couldn't be here at the last minute for travel reasons, um, but uh, the number two contributor panel is here, uh, Mark Scott Madsen. He um, is the lead data science scientist developer at Orsted, although he can pronounce that better than I can. Um, while I'll be represented by Sylvain Corlet, uh, who is the founder and CEO of QuantStack, and Streamlit by Adrian Triu, the co-founder of Streamlit.io. And it's kind of worth thinking about right before we dive into it, just the to put everything out in the open about who's presenting these tools, who's pushing them, who stands to benefit from them, and uh, try to balance between their Python open source, and but they you want to have a tool that's well funded, and you really you want to somehow connect money to uh, developers and get problems solved, and they each have different models, and I don't know how much people will talk about those different models. Um, but uh, for instance, Panel is primarily funded by outside clients of Anaconda who, who pay for money, to, who give money to Anaconda for certain things to be added to the ecosystem. Uh, Plotly, um, I guess, makes money on their server products. Uh, Streamlit is, is new. They'll probably tell you how they make money and so on. Um, uh, voila, Quantstack tends to get outside contracts as well. So everybody can talk about, about that aspect of that. And hopefully everyone will be open and honest and, uh, and, and uh, clear about what drives development in the library and how you can go forward with that library if you choose to. All right, so I'm ready to step back and I'm just gonna listen to these presentations. And then after the end of the presentation, everybody's got 15 minutes, then we'll come back for uh, Q&A and discussion and comparison between libraries and so if anyone has any um, questions like that or discussion topics, please put it on the Slack channel and then we'll uh, revisit those at the, uh, or visit those at the end of all the talks. So over to Nicholas. All right, hello everyone. I'm gonna start my timer here. Um, thanks for, for inviting me, uh, Jim. My name is Nicholas Krushten. Uh, I am head of data visualization at Plotly. I, I'm also a VP of product um, and I'm, I'm excited to, to sort of talk a little bit about Dash uh, here today. So um, Jim went over some of this already. Uh, we call Dash uh, an analytical app framework uh, here at Plotly. Um, pretty easy to install, pip install Dash. We're downloaded some number of times a month. Um, Dash uh, as a framework was initiated and is supported by Plotly, uh, Plotly the company. We also make Plotly the Python library. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, Dash is an MIT licensed uh, open source uh, library. It is the open core of the Dash enterprise product that, that Plotly sells. So Plotly has an open core uh, business model. We, we develop uh, Dash and we sell Dash enterprise and they're, they're two sort of separate things. Um, they're just uh, one clarification. There's no sort of free version and expensive version of Dash. It's all the same Dash. Uh, I'll talk a tiny bit about our, our commercial offering at the end, just for clarification purposes. Um, I wanted to kick off with a, with a little live demo um, of sort of what, uh, what it's like to, to, to work with the Dash app. So hopefully um, this is big enough to fit. Um, no, here we go. Uh, so here is basically code wise, what a Dash app uh, minimally, I guess, is. Um, you've got a couple of imports, you create the app. There are two little pieces here. There is a layout and uh, optionally some callbacks, and then you run the app. So let me kind of run this app um, and we can see what it looks like. Uh, if I run this app, this is, this is the output. So the layout is a little tree here uh, of, uh, of components. So I've got an input component and an H1 component. And the callbacks are a little bit like Excel formulas. They, uh, they map inputs to outputs. And so in this particular case, I'm mapping uh, the children of the out component. Uh, there's a function that, that, that drives this based on the value of the in component. And what, what that transformation is, is just, it just says hello. And so here I can say, hello, you know, pi data global, uh, nice to meet you. Um, so basically what happens is every time I type a character into this text field, that Python function is called. That's what Dash gives you. Uh, you don't have to know any JavaScript. Um, to, to make this work, uh, you don't have to write any backend, uh, you know, REST methods or anything like that. You don't have to wrangle any JSON. You kind of lay out what your app is going to look like here in this layout, and you wire it up with callbacks. Okay, so far so good. Um, if you run this app with debug equals true, 
you have this little blue puck at the bottom here. This is your developer tools. It tells you that your server is up. You don't have any errors. There's a little error panel. Uh, and you have a little uh, interactive graph here of your callback. So here, okay, yes, this is basically what I've got. I've got a very simple in-out uh, relationship. Now I'm going to switch over to a slightly fancier app. Um, this one is called Fancy. I might have to, to scroll a tiny bit. So this is about four, you know 40 lines of Python. Uh, it's got roughly the same structure. I'm going to just call out the, the layout here uh, has an H1, uh, a dropdown, and then two graphs. And then I have two callbacks. The first callback uh, binds the dropdown to the graph, and the second one binds the dropdown and the first graph to the second. So let me just kind of run this and show um, what that can look like to make it a little clearer. So the, uh, the app has reloaded. And in this particular case, I've got a dropdown, a scatter plot, and a map. Um, and the, the, the callback graph whoop, for this has been a little bit confused, but I can sort of tease it out. Um, and I've got my, I guess this isn't worth spending time on, um, but I've got my, my graph. And so I can change the, the year that I'm presenting data for, and you can see everything updates. And I can make a selection over here. And that selection is reflected on the graph below. So this is kind of an example of what you can do uh, with a Dash app. The callbacks, I, I hit them just because the visual, visual noise, but they're not very long. Uh, the first one basically just displays a scatter plot filtered by the dropdown. And the second one displays a map filtered by the selection of the, of the previous one. So mostly what I wanted to show here is that you can put lots of different things uh, in, your, in your layout. Um, and anything can be an input. Anything can be an output. So that's what a, what a Dash app sort of minimal, minimally has to be. Um, and I'm going to switch back to my deck for a second here to, to just kind of uh, highlight, you know, there's the layout, which is basically a tree of Dash components that have props, and then callbacks. Uh, any component can be an input or an output. I also wanted to give you a sense of what a Dash app can be um, by, by showing you Dash apps, sort of some, some in the wild, some of our demos. So Dash apps can be dashboards, sort of typical, uh, you know, dashboard types presentations. You zoom in, things filter. Uh, this is using Dask and uh, Data Shader for sort of large data processing. Um, so this is a typical kind of dashboard style app where you're making selections and querying a static data set. Uh, you can have this nice interactive uh, graph. Dash apps can be printable reports. This is uh, uh, an example from our, our gallery. Uh, this is a multi-page app. So each page of this printable report has its own dedicated URL. Uh, and you can have a full view where you can kind of scroll through. You can hit Command P uh, on a Mac, and this thing will print, Control P on Windows. Um, so a Dash app can, uh, can power uh, a printable report. Uh, a Dash app can be a slide deck. Uh, you can have components that look like uh, that look like slides, and you can sort of connect these things to live data sources if you want. Um, here, I'm just going to play like two seconds of this YouTube video without sound. Uh, a Dash app can be a very sophisticated workflow tool with dozens of dropdowns and this sort of like multiple step thing where you've got you know select a file and check the messages and multi-file plots. So it can be a multi-step, uh, you know, wizard type thing that produces dozens of charts, sends emails. Um, whatever you want. So there's some, some interesting bioinformatics stuff going on here. Uh, Dash apps can be scientific communication tools. So this is a beautiful uh, application that was uh, released alongside uh, a paper in Nature. Um, and we're increasingly seeing scientists basically like publishing papers and then, and then publishing Dash apps alongside to give folks access to the data or algorithms that their papers are about. Um, so this is the entire thing here is a Dash app, uh, including the user guide, which is pretty cool. Uh, and then the last thing is Dash apps can be kind of fun and engaging. This is like a retirement planner. Um, you know, it's like you, uh, you say you want to retire at 59, you hit go, and this thing will generate a nice, uh, attractive little report for you. Um, at least I did earlier, yeah. So you've got your sort of expected wealth over time, various different things. These are all sort of data driven based on the, the calculator that was above, and you've got some extra charts that you can make. So that's what a Dash app can be. Um, and I know I'm kind of doing the thing where it's like draw two circles and then draw the rest of the owl, but you have to kind of uh, believe me that um, all of these apps that I showed you are basically built out of these, these two primitives. You've got a, uh, a tree of Dash components with props and you've got callbacks that wire them up. Um, so hopefully that can be a little bit inspiring in terms of what can be. Um, the, I'll have a link to this deck in, uh, at the very end here. So to give you a sense of who uses Dash, uh, you know, we, we have direct reports and direct communications with, with sort of Python first timers who are really excited. They've picked up Python and Dash and bit of as and PyData all at once, uh, and they're really excited. And some, some Python old hands, um, who Dash is for, uh, data scientists, scientists, engineers, analysts, 
uh, people working in finance, pharma, energy, utilities, government, sport, media, tech. Um, there's not really, you know, a vertical that, that the Dash is sort of specifically for. Uh, and, and we're really seeing folks using Dash in sort of uh, all of the different departments of, of these organizations. So if you see yourself on this deck, you know, Dash is for you. If you don't, I'm sorry, I missed you. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, it really is intended to be a general purpose tool. So let's get, let's get down to, to brass tacks. Uh, Dash is backend architecture. So Dash is built using Flask um, under the hood. Uh, and therefore, you can deploy a Dash app uh, anywhere you can deploy a Flask app. It deploys on Heroku, it deploys on any cloud host. We have you know, users and customers that have deployed a uh, Dash app pretty much anywhere you can think of. Uh, Dash's backend has a totally stateless HTTP uh, type of pattern. So each of the callbacks that are written are sort of pure functional callbacks. They can be executed by any worker. If you have a load balancer in front of a, of a Dash app, you can have dozens of workers spread across you know, 10 or 12 uh, machines if you want. And uh, you can just do a round robin kind of distribution. It's trivial to scale horizontally, dynamically. You can just add workers or remove them um, uh, to, to a kind of a cluster of running Dash apps. Or you can just you know, run a single Dash app with G-Unicorn and, and, and use three or four processes or something like that to handle load. So this is sort of one of the big strengths of Dash uh, is this stateless architecture. Uh, and uh, I guess it's implicit in the, the little app that I showed you, but there's no limit to the library, libraries that you can use. You, know, you can use Torch, you can use uh, TensorFlow, whatever it is you want, you have full access to the Python code. The promise that Dash makes is that whatever the user does in the browser will call the Python function that you have asked to be called. Um, and whatever that Python function does is up to you. Connect to databases, call APIs, run things. Um, so long as it's a, a, a kind of a pure functional operation, um, Dash, Dash will work. Dash's front end architecture uh, is built on top of React. We published a cute little article that says, you know, Dash is React for Python, that confused some people. Um, so, so Dash uh, is built using React. And the reason we said that Dash is React for Python is that any React component can be turned into a Dash component. We have a, uh, a system called the Dash component boilerplate. You kind of annotate your React component, you know, turn the crank, and out comes a Dash component. Um, so that tree, that layout, uh, that layout tree, uh, can contain anything that can be a React component. So out of the box, we have um, you know every HTML element has been wrapped. Uh, we have a, a, a bundle of components called the Dash core components, which includes sort of inputs and dropdowns and sliders and graphs, which are powered by Plotly. Uh, the graphing library um, and sliders and so on. So there's a bunch of first party components that come with Dash. Um, first party being, being Plotly, I guess, uh, the, the people who made it. Um, and uh, alongside Plotly maintains some other libraries such as a Cytoscape.js um, Dash component for network visualizations, DAC for, we call it data acquisition, but it's basically a bunch of widgets that look like physical widgets. Uh, we have Dash Bio, which is a set of bioinformatics focused components. Uh, we have wrapped uh, VTK, working with the developers of VTK for high performance scientific visualization. And there are also third party components. So the community has really stepped up and there's a, there's a company uh, maintaining a bootstrap uh, set of components for, for styling your app. Um, some people you know, really like Leaflet as opposed to the, the Plotly powered maps. So they've built um, Dash Leaflet set of components. So it's pretty easy to, to make a React component into a Dash component. And there's lots of people doing that uh, and not sharing the results. Uh, many of our customers will have custom components um, in, in the apps that they're building. The Dash ecosystem is also pretty broad. Um, you know, I'm here at PyData. Uh, I love Python. Uh, we have a backend for for, for Python, um, but the the front end can be connected to to you know any kind of backend. Uh, and so we have a backend for R. We have a backend for Julia. We have a backend for F Sharp. So this is a you know a broader ecosystem, and folks who are using other languages are able to leverage all the same set of front end components uh, from their language of choice. And we have made it such that the the, the various backends are sort of you know, mutually compatible in terms of design, so you can kind of move back and forth and, and reuse some of the principles that you, uh, you have learned. Uh, Dash supports any graphing library in principle. Uh, any of the graphing libraries that exist in the Python ecosystem can be wrapped in a React component and therefore a Dash component. Uh, I've done it. Uh, most of our users use Plotly in practice. Definitely, you know, this is what we use in our documentation. Uh, the Dash team and the Plotly team back in Back in the day when you know I wasn't sitting in my spare bedroom all the time, we used to sit a few meters from each other. Um, so, so definitely, uh, you know, Plotly is, is the one that's best documented. But there's not any technical limitation for any other graphing libraries. 
For developing uh, Dash applications in Jupyter, we have a, a lookalike package called Jupyter Dash, which is sort of drop in instead of Dash, uh, and you can build uh, applications in Jupyter. Although I will say most people do build um, do build their Dash apps in something like VS Code or uh, or PyCharm. Um, a Dash app, when you deploy it, you know, runs from a Python file, um, and uh, and you know, this is this we call these apps. They they really are intended to be sort of like software engineering and and, and deployed and testable. Um, and then finally, a big part of the Dash ecosystem uh, is our Dash Enterprise product. So Dash Enterprise basically adds to Dash open source. Um, we add you know, deployment uh, tooling, some infrastructure, some additional components, and support from Plotly. So there is nothing limited. We have not crippled Dash open source. Uh, Dash open source is a, is a powerful, you know, uh, heavily adopted tool. Every single one of our enterprise customers uses Dash open source every day. It is the core of Dash Enterprise. It is uh, supported by Plotly. Our business model, you know, we sell software, we sell Dash Enterprise, and we sell support for Dash Enterprise. Uh, and we reinvest an enormous amount of that money into, uh, into the open source ecosystem, be that the Dash core, the Plotly graphing library, any of the components, uh, answering questions on the forum, et cetera. So that's a little a bit about the Dash Nicholas, ecosystem. Uh, yep. uh, well, we are almost over. You may have one minute. Yep, more one minute. Time. That's all I need. <laughs> so to get started, uh, just visit dash.plotly.com. If you want to see more cool apps uh, with source available, go to dash.gallery. Um, we have a very active community forum at community.plotly.com uh, where people, the, my favorite part of this is the show and tell where people post uh, the apps that I then come and show in talks like this. Um, if you want uh, access to this slide deck, so you can click on these links yourself, go to bit.ly uh, slash PDG, PyData Global, PDG hyphen dash. Um, that is the link to this. And I am, I'm really excited to uh, be part of this panel, uh, hear what the, other, what the other folks have to say and then, and then have a, a nice positive discussion and I'll, in my last 15 seconds, say thanks to Jim and say that I'm very proud to be part of a community where, where we do this kind of thing and, and, uh, and have these fun sessions and, and, and sort of exchange like this. So, so thanks to the other panelists as well. Thank you, Nicholas. Really great presentation. <clears throat> so my name is Mark, and I'm here to give an introduction to panel, and thanks for taking the time. So um, what you see here is actually a panel app, and that's what I'll, I'll be doing for my talk. I'll be using a panel app. So you can find actually this app at my GitHub site, Max Gormason, awesome panel introduction. And you really should check it out because you can find all the code and you can also open the app right now on Binder and also find the code on Binder. So uh, back to the presentation. So a little bit about me. So I'm at here actually, uh, I'm not working for a company called Panel or something like that or for Anaconda. I'm working for a company called Erster. I'm not representing Erster here. Uh, in this talk, I'm re representing my, myself and my pat passion, which is uh, data apps. Um, but just to tell you a little bit about my employer. So Erster is uh, ranked the most sustainable energy company in the world, three years running. It's the leading offshore wind um, company, and it's also becoming a renewable energy major as we speak. Check it out. Um, a little bit more about me. You can check out my site, Data Models Analytics. So this is a little bit about me. About me. You can see me here. I'm working for Traders. This is not Traders and Erster. This is just a general picture. But I'm working for Traders every day. And it's a fast-paced environment with a lot of data, a lot of visualizations, and a lot of things changing all the time. We make a lot of small apps all the time. Some of these apps stay around. Some are thrown away the day after. So um, in order to support use cases like that, and also to support a, a medium-sized company where we have engineers, we have analysts, we have scientists, we have data scientists, we have DevOps, we have machine learning experts. I was looking for a data app framework. I wanted something where it's really easy to use the application end-to-end -end in a lot of situations. So both for data exploration I'm really into data exploration, not only making charts, but I really want to make them interactive with small widgets like sliders or drop downs or something like that. So I can really filter in and focus and discuss with myself and my colleagues. Also in twint in the sense that it should reach production. It should be really easy to get to production. So getting things out as a report, a static report or an interactive uh, web app. And it's Python we are talking about here. So 
uh, I wanted something that could bridge that as well. I wanted something where you can easily build a lot of apps, like a multi-page app. So what you see here is actually a multi-page app. It's pretty easy. I just have 10 Python files. Each is a, a Python uh, application, a panel application, and then you can yeah, start it up. And maybe we should actually take a look how does um, something like an application look? So here we have a simple application. It's actually Seaborn, and you can just change the color of the plot. It's not really advanced. This might be like the output from a machine learning model instead, and you want to play around with some of the arguments to the function. Um, but the key thing is I can use Seaborn here because I was also looking for something where I can work together with my colleagues end to end. Some people prefer or need Matplotlib for their use cases. Some people need or prefer Bokeh, some Plotly. Some people prefer eCharts, for example, because they are nice like to transitions when you change the plot, right? It looks really fresh and modern. And I wanted something where you can so sort of take uh, Python's database end to end and collaborate, collaborate on and, and this panel provides as well. I want something and you'll see that where you can really build like streaming, streaming applications I wanted something where beginners in Python could work, for example, in notebooks, because that's often where they start out. So you can build panel apps or do exploratory data analysis with panel in notebooks, and we'll see that. I also, because I'm an old grumpy coder, you could say, I want to work in VS Code, and I want to be efficient there. And I have a lot of colleagues working in PyCharm, and I want a framework that supports all these use cases. So let's get back to the introduction. So no matter where you are, especially like if you're a domain expert somehow, then a panel is something for you. I run two sites. So I run awesomepanel.org and awesomestreamlet.org. So I think you should check them out as well. Um, so one of the promises and something I'm really pretty interested is in is that this really works with the tools you know and love. So we can check some of this out, Python's uh, this. So as you can see here, you might see your favorite plotting library here. Let's take a, take a look and see, okay, this is Altair, this is Bokeh, this is DeckGL. It takes a little bit to load, but it's really nice. E-charts, pretty nice, Folium, and so on. And if you are out there, if you, are working with the repository I made and open the app, you can find all the code for each example here. You can just drop that in and run it. Um, so we, we also support Plotly, of course, Plot9, PyDeck, and so on. Um, this template that you see here, it's also pretty nice. It's not something you have to develop because I want my applications to look smooth. Right, I'm going to communicate with colleagues or stakeholders or customers, and it just needs to, to look nice. So it should be really easy to make nice applications um, because yeah, I need to communicate and sell uh, my things. And that's also one thing I would like to say today, actually, that no matter which data app framework is your favorite, I believe you should look into data app frameworks it's a superpower for you and your team to be able to master a data app framework because then you can really explore your data and you can really showcase it to your colleagues and stakeholders again. So you can get out there with your data and your models and get feedback and iterate. That's really important. One of the promises that's also pretty important for me is actually that we're bridging here. So we can actually use IPy widgets. I've just put in a few here. For example, you can use iPad leaflet if you're into iPad leaflet. That's a really advanced and, and complex library. It's really, really, really powerful. But here I put in iPad sheets and you can see here we have a, a slider and yeah, it reacts to this. And we have iPad widgets as well. And yeah, we can use them. One of the things I was also looking for was like highly reactive applications. I wanted, I wanted uh, to be able to react to events from my plots like uh, hover and click and stuff like that. So a lot of these plotting libraries like Holoviews or Plotly or eCharts provides that, and I can use that with panel. That's pretty amazing. So for example, here we are looking at Holoviews 
And if you have not heard of Holoviews, it's a part of Holovis, which is an ecosystem of data visualization tools uh, of which Panel is a member. And all these tools integrate really nicely with Panel. So here you can see we have nice interactivity. Here we can yeah, make our own data, our own chart, and we have uh, reactivity bindings here. Similarly, here we have HVPlot. What is HVPlot, you might ask? But this is a data visualization library that should make it really easy for you to make interactive plots. So what's the easiest way and most well-known way? That's uh, the pandas plotting API. So pandas.plot or dataframe.plot. And it's actually the same. HVPlot is a pandas.plot API. So we have a data frame called Sprint. And then we just, instead of writing .plot, we write .hvplot and then we get a nice uh, violin plot. One of the true gems or unique things of the Holovis ecosystem, something that's unique in the Python data ecosystem is data shader. And what problem does data shader solve? It solves the problem of big data, right? We get more and more data, like millions of rows or billions of rows, where we need to apply Desk or um, CUDA or something like that in the background to work with them. But we also want to visualize it. And that's what data shader enables us to do. It can really like visualize um, terabytes of data at CERN or places like that. And just to, to tell you that I really believe that that's a really strong hole of panel. The strong integration with data shader is that, for example, um, rabbits, they built a big data visualization uh, framework on top of panel and data shader. So uh, Rabbits built this uh, Cox filter on top of panel and Bokeh and DeckGL and all this stuff. And if you look at it here, you can see this is actually panel apps, highly interactive on big amounts of data. And I think they're pretty nice. Then there is Pram and Pram is uh, powerful parameters for your applications. It's actually what, one of the things I really like about uh, working with panel is that it uh, it makes it easy for you to make uh, reusable components, right? You can say this is, this is a domain model. This could be anything. It could be in finance, a Black-Scholes model or something like that. Here's just addition. We have two parameters, A and B, and we have a resulting function that here it returns a string, but it could also return matplotlib or whatever, and panel will like magically display it. And if we look at the code, param, so all it is is really we have a class. You can think of it as a data class. We sprinkle in a little bit of param magic, param.param tries to define our parameters as a number and an integer. And it's act it actually matters because now we have validation. A is a floating number and B is an integer. And if somebody inputs something else, we will uh, get validation errors. And one more powerful thing is that a panel can use this because we don't have to tell or think about which widgets we'll use. Panel can just magically uh, say panel.param on this class, and then we get widgets. And then we can place our widgets inside a column together with the resulting output function here, and we will get a nice function like this. So it means we can build like libraries of domain models independent of panel, but we can quickly visualize using panel. And panel, of course, is a part of uh, all of this. So you can build nice dashboards, for example. So again, let's take an example app just to, to look at the code. How does, how does code like this look? So we could try this one. So this is this really illustrates often what is the problem. The problem is really we have some code. It has nothing to do with data apps or panel or anything. Here, the example is somebody's favorite uh, plotting library is Seaborn. And they've made a function here with an argument, input argument, a green color. And can we, um, and that's the function that they have. Then they want to make it interactive. And that's where we can sprinkle in a little bit of magic from panel. We always need to run pn.extension, so panel.extension. And we want to sprinkle in a drop down or select widget here with a default color value and some colors we can choose from. And we want to make this function interactive so we 
can bind that function to the widget. That's what you do here. And then we wrap it up in a nice template, give the template some nice colors and so on. And we put our select widget in the sidebar and the interactive function in the main. And then we run panel serve the name of the script. And then we get uh, a nice application that we can work with. Let us just check it out. Yeah, and this is the application that we saw in the beginning. And for me, at least, it's not a lot of code you have to to do in in order to um, to get something like this. So, Mark, a reminder that yeah. uh, only one more minute would be left. Yeah, thanks. Then I'll just uh, wrap up. Important for me is also that it just works in your notebook and IDE. So here you have Jupyter, you have Colab, you have VS Code, the interactive environment. You have VS Code, like Python files, old grumpy coder like me, I'm using this. And the good thing is whenever I save my code, it just updates over here. So that's pretty nice. And yeah. One important kind of application is really the cross filtering that is pretty easy to make. An application like this with panel. So you have nice cross filtering here like that. And if we go back, then I will uh, finalize by saying you should check out some of these nice resources. So check out the panel site. Really nice. There's a getting started guide, a user guide, a reference gallery, and so on. You should check out panel on GitHub and give it a star. I think it deserves it. And yeah, check out some of these other links. But if you are into like nice interactive GIFs, GIFs check out the panel on Twitter and you'll see a lot of the different like use cases for, for panel illustrated by the community. And when you start out, you should also go to the, to the community site to get help or just showcase what you can do. So go here and showcase what you can do. Um, that's a, a nice and inviting place to be. So uh, thank you for your time. Thanks a lot, Mark. Um, moving on, I would now like to invite Sylvain. OK, thanks, everyone. So uh, let's talk about Voila. Uh, but before talking about Voila, I I'd like to talk about myself a little bit. I hope that you all un uh, understand my quaint French accent. Uh, so my name is Sylvain Corley. I'm the founder and CEO of Quantstack. So for those who don't know Quantstack, it's a uh, Paris and Berlin-based uh, software development company. We are we essentially specialize in open source software for scientific computing. The team comprises uh, about ten core developers of Jupyter, and we're also very active in the Kanda Forge ecosystem. Um, and as an open source developer, I'm personally very involved in, in the in the Jupyter project. And I'm one of the co-developers and co-creators of Voila. I also do a lot of volunteer work in the community. I'm a, one of the members of the board of directors of NumFocus, and I also organized the Pilot at Paris meetup. Uh, last year, I was a vice chair of JupyterCon, uh, which was an online conference about Jupyter in uh, late 2020. Um, so uh, before I get into Voila, uh, let's have a quick word about Jupyter. So what's Jupyter? Uh, I think most people know it, but Jupyter, more than just a notebook, it's a collection of interoperable tools for interactive computing. So it's really meant to address all of the stages of a scientist workflows from the exploratory phase of their work to the presentation of their results. So it's a collection of open standards, more than a single application and a single implementation for a concept like the notebook we actually devised a world-specified set of file formats, protocols, so that anyone can replace a component of the stack and still interpret with the rest of them. And most importantly, it provides a, a notebook, which is a document-oriented interface for discovery and documentation. 
And the notebook was credited as being one of the first implementations of the literate computing paradigm by of Donald Knuth, where users actually mix uh, narrative content with executable code, producing a content that you know where you can carry uh, a reasoning and you know have you know and the explanation of the program alongside it, alongside the, the source code. Um, so one uh, extension point of the Jupyter ecosystem is the Jupyter widgets ecosystem. So what, what Jupyter widgets are, they are special objects that have a, an interactive representation, like a visual representation in the Jupyter notebook or in other Jupyter-based frontends. Um, so initially, it was really meant to serve like as a small set of controls that you could like put next to a plot so that you can change some parameter and see the impact of that parameter on the outcome of your, of your computation. But actually, from the start, we built it as a framework that you, you can build upon, right? And today, there is a vibrant ecosystem of custom widgets, like IPyGani for 3D plotting. So there is a nice animation at the uh, lower left corner of IPyGani with like some wave simulation. BQ Plot is a plotting library that was built upon IPy widgets, um, IPy Volume for volume rendering, IPy Leaflet for maps. Uh, I think that the current Plotly uh, Python uh, library actually is built upon IPy widgets today, uh, which was a huge vote of confidence for, for the framework. Uh, IPy WebRTC for video streaming, we got graph library. There is a, like a really vibrant ecosystem of such libraries and that are really nicely interoperated with each other because you can bind any attribute of such a library with a, the equivalent attribute of another library and like make complex applications using all of them together. So the thing is, when you try to communicate with notebooks, Notebooks can be great for you know, working your audience through your reasoning as you're trying to explain how you built a program, like for example, for a class, but it's not the best tool for all audiences. For example, the, one of the main issues that people experience with notebooks is that the most interesting content tends to be in the end because that the stuff that you are building in the notebook and like the nice chart that you want to show to everyone is in the end. And by then you may have lost half of your audience, especially those who don't want to see code. And also if you really want to offer the full interactivity of widgets to end users, if you actually are using the notebook, you actually need to provide an execution environment for the user of the notebook so that they can move sliders and uh, interact with the kernel. So that's another issue in terms of security. And finally, if the audience that you want to show your results to is not interested in seeing the code, but only the narrative content and the figures, then you're also in bad shape. So some people built some plugins to the notebook to hide the code and to change the layout, but it didn't quite strike it because it didn't resolve the execution model and uh, how we could you know, securely share these applications. And yeah, so there were lots of challenges. So essentially we need tools to look at the book differently. So I wanted to point, I'm going to send the link after um, to a blog post that we recently published on the Jupyter blog by Mariana Berles about looking at notebooks uh, with different glasses. I think this was a really nice blog post summarizing all of you know, the current tooling that's available for in the, in the Jupyter ecosystem. So now let's get into Voila. So Voila transform notebooks into standalone applications. So it can de be deployed securely to serve content publicly. And it also provides a templating system allowing authors to change the notebook layout and turn notebooks into either like interactive dashboards with a rich layout or slideshows, or just like a, like a one page document really looking like a notebook without the input areas. So Voila is also, and this is really something I want to emphasize. More than is like a separate tour from the Jupyter ecosystem, Voila is really a Jupyter story. We didn't build Voila from the ground up, like on the side, we reused existing components from the Jupyter ecosystem. So the notebook format, the kernel protocol, the end becomes the templates, and a lot of the improvements to the underlying components over the past couple of years were motivated by Voila. So basically, Voila helped a lot improve and be converted in all of the Jupyter stack. So basically, Voila is very interoperable with the Jupyter ecosystem. And one important aspect of Jupyter 
uh, that is key, like it's, it's one of the most popular extension points is that Jupyter is agnostic to the programming language. You can write, you can use, you know, Jupyter kernels for C++ or Lua or many other languages. And it's also the case with Voila. And I think that Voila is probably unique in that way in that it's a language agnostic dashboarding tool. You can make a dashboard in C++ using Voila. Uh, so how do you use Voila? Here I have a very simple Python notebook with a Bikuprat figure. And you know it's interactive, so there is some you know zooming and panning happening like that requires some run to the backend in this case, and you can try it locally very easily by just typing voila and the name of the notebook, and it will spawn a small web server on your machine, and you know just serve your notebook in an interactive fashion, and you can still do all of the things that you were doing with the notebook, even if it requires some computation in the backend if you were doing, uh, I don't know, some analysis, some PCA, whatever it may be. It works exactly the same as in the notebook. And essentially, so Voila executes the notebook and provides you with a kernel. But in order to, to share it securely, the way it works is by changing and turning around the execution model. So in the case of Voila, essentially the main difference is that the front end doesn't send any execution request. There is no arbitrary code execution. All it does is asking for a specific notebook to be executed. And then the backend is going to serve the rendered notebook progressively and keep the kernel around for the user so that you can you know, stay on the page and interact with the widgets. And the kernel will only be shut down if you are idle for a long period of time or if you close the tab. Uh, so yeah, I already insisted on language agnosticism. In this example, I'm showing a C++ uh, notebook uh, that's using the uh, Zeus Kling kernel. That's a, a C++ kernel based on the Kling C++ interpreter that was developed at CERN. And you know, Zeus Kling supports interactive widgets. And here I'm making a very simple application where you can draw an NIPI leaflet map and like get some you know, C++ callback. And uh, so if you are really, uh, if you really have trouble with Python and you prefer C++, you can write all of this and there is no Python involved whatsoever in that dashboard. So you're safe. Um, so another important project of that ecosystem is the Voila Gallery. So it's a, Voila Gallery is actually a Jupyter Hub extension. Uh, so it was announced by Jeremy Tulu on the Jupyter blog like some time ago. And um, but there, there is a lot of development in that space at the moment. So we are working on a binder-based Voila gallery right now. So you can either deploy the gallery as a binder extension or as a Jupyter Hub extension. Another extension point to Voila is the template system. So essentially, uh, it, when rendering notebooks to the user, uh, you can actually apply some you know templating system so that you can change the layout or you know change the appearance of uh, of uh, like add some css or add like a header footer anything you want like a logo for a company uh, and uh, so we have a fairly generic templating system that extends the one of nb convert and a collection of fairly actively developed templates so one is voila beautify which is a Vitify JS based template, which is very, I would say, mobile friendly. Uh, we have Voila Grid Stack, which is a dashboard template where you can rearrange uh, widgets and in, in a complex fashion. And Voila Reveal, which is meant to produce slideshows. So I, I didn't have the elegance uh, of Mark to use uh, Voila to make my presentation about Voila, but maybe I should have. Um, and uh, so Voila Grid Stack is uh, this one I was talking about, which is uh, a means to uh, you know rearrange a notebook cells in with a complex layout. The layout being saved to the notebook metadata, so that when you open it with Voila, you get the layout and rendered as expected. And we also have a visual editor uh, for Grid Stack templates that integrates well with JupyterLab and produces such interactive dashboards. And this one is a, a dashboard about flavors of scotch that was produced by IBM a long time ago for another project that was called Jupyter Dashboards. And I actually used that one, that one dashboard for this example because we decided to keep the same layout format as the original project by IBM so that we can render all of the original dashboards from Jupyter Dashboards, which is a deprecated project. 
What I reveal is this template for turning notebooks into slideshows. What I beautify is a mobile-friendly template that works really well uh, in combination with the iPad Beautify uh, Jupyter Widgets library. And now let's talk about the future. So in the next release of Voila, we are we have already merged actually, and it's that we are in the pre-release cycle for this release. Um, we enable the kernel hot pooling so that um, Voila dashboards rendered uh, render immediately because we have a pool of pre-rendered dashboards uh, ready for for the user. Um, we're also working on enabling uh, Jupyter Lite kernels to have pure WebAssembly uh, dashboards that execute fully in the browser. So if you're aware of Jupyter Lite, if you're not aware of Jupyter Lab, you should definitely check it out. Jupyter Lite is a distribution of Jupyter Lab that works entirely in the browser, including the language kernel, so including Python, and it's based on a Python distribution compiled to WebAssembly called Pyodide. So yeah, you should definitely Google that. Jupyter Lite. And uh, in the long term, we'll be working on the collaborative editing features for uh, the Voila grid stack layout editors, and also doing some experimentation about having Voila dashboards that enable some collaboration, collaboration features. For example, you may have presence, you may see other users, cursors, that type of stuff. Uh, and finally, uh, it's not a one-man show. There, there are lots of developers uh, who contributed to, to Voila, and uh, I wanted to highlight uh, the names in the last slide. And that's it for me. I hope I didn't go over. Seems not. Great. Thanks a lot, Sylvain. I would now hand it over to Adrian. Hi, everyone. Um, great to be here. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I also want to point out that uh, Marissa Smith is here from Streamlit on our community team. Uh, she helped me prepare this presentation. And so, uh, hi, Marissa. So, uh, yeah, very happy to be here. Um, thank you so much, Jim, for inviting me. Um, and I also want to say I just really love the tone of this, um, this whole presentation. I uh, I, uh, you know, well, I'm a former academic and I love the Python community and I love this sort of academic feeling and, and, and seeing all the commonalities and actually how all of these technologies are built on very similar stacks. So very happy to be here. Um, and especially at PyData. Why? Because two years ago, Streamlit was launched at PyData LA back when you could actually go somewhere and see people. Uh, and I uh, showed uh, this thing called Streamlit. Um, and I also showed you guys a super janky demo, uh, which we're going to re uh, revisit a little bit today. Um, and, uh, and so since then, uh, over the past two years, uh, it's really been amazing. Uh, Streamlit has taken off incredibly. We've just launched a whole bunch of really cool features. Uh, the response in the in the uh, community has been amazing. And so it's kind of a wonderful to come back here two years later, and especially on the eve of another, uh, or right after, I should say, another uh, big milestone for us, uh, which is the launch of 1.0, uh, which is basically for us, it means that uh, the original vision for which Dreamlit could be, we'll get into that super easy way to turn your Python scientific scripts into apps, uh, has been the initial story has been uh, complete. And so uh, I wanted to just share with you guys a cool video, uh, which kind of shows a little bit uh, the journey that we've been on since the original Pi Data presentation of Streamlit.
Cool. So uh, yeah, a whole bunch of stuff has happened uh, uh, over the past uh, uh, year, and I want to share two years. I want to share that with you, but I want to take a step back and just um, first of all introduce myself and say hello. So I'm Adrian. I'm the co-founder uh, and one of the co-creators of Streamlit, the open source project. Um, and I have uh, a background actually as an academic. So I was a professor at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, then I went over to Google X and started helping with self-driving cars and other crazy scientific projects. I went over to Zoox and, and helped them build self-driving cars. And then in uh, 2018, founded Streamlit and uh, launched it in 2019. Uh, and I guess the point here is that um, I have seen a lot of uh, machine learning groups and been in a lot of machine learning groups uh, at the time and uh, over these years and um and so I kind of created uh, Streamlit. Uh, the original idea was just to make it really simple to uh, take a scripts that you were writing, and these could be uh, data transformations, uh, but it also could be just sort of like the, the scripts that you have lying around in your computer uh, and the Python script that you have lying around in your computer and make those visual in some way, make the ability to see how they're operating, see what's going on in all the matrices and the NumPy arrays and the data frames, uh, and actually play with them. Uh, without having to go through a sort of tedious um, rewrite, uh, edit the code. Uh, that's part of the flow as well, but you want a way to, uh, to be able to play with these things and then share with them share them with others. Uh, and the result is, uh, I think, uh, a tool that's been really remarkably useful, uh, not only for simple uh you know, dashboarding style use cases like the one that you see on the left, but also uh, for just sort of general Python computation and in particular machine learning, which is my background. And I just want to call out something. I wanted to show you guys this video because it's so cool. But then I was like, there's probably some copyright issues or something. But anyway, go to Project Strike Oppose uh, on Google. Uh, and uh, it's a it's a it's a uh, Adobe project that was released yesterday. And it's just so mind bending. Ending. Uh, here we have a source image, and then you can add a target pose, which is just an image. And then uh, it generates a new image, uh, which is uh, of that source person, but in the target pose. Just completely mind-blowing stuff, uh, really incredible. Um, the least impressive thing by far is that it was created in Streamlit. Uh, and you can actually see there, that's a Streamlit interface. Um, and, and actually, I'm sort of very proud of the fact that that's the least impressive part of the demo. And that's kind of the whole part point of Streamlit, uh, which is that it sort of fades into the background and lets you just think about your the code itself. And so uh, as uh, Jim invited me to give this presentation, I was it actually really was a moment for me to reflect about, well, what is it that, uh, that I think makes Streamlit special and why... Uh, is it, you know, the integration with this or that library, or is there something deeper? And I really came down to two ideas that I want to share with you guys. Uh, the first one is simplicity, and the second one is community. And really, there's a lot more to both of these than you might think. So I'll start off with uh, simplicity and give a quote from Travis Oliphant, who's a uh, 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 the, the father of NumPy and SciPy, and I think probably as responsible as anybody for the creation of the entire Python data ecosystem, which we are all uh, thriving in and, and hopefully working together to grow. And he had a super interesting uh, talk with uh, Lex Fridman, uh, another hero of mine, uh, a couple of weeks ago that I listened to. And he said something interesting about Python that I think really hit the nail on the head. Why is Python so special? Is it because it's really amazing at multi-threading? No, <laughs> actually the, it has a global interpreter lock and it's like kind of terrible at multi-threading, but somehow it has turned into the most spoken programming language in the world and has this huge effect, not only in the data world, but DevOps and education and other places. And what he said was Python lets you do, wait a minute, I'm getting this wrong. Python lets you do a lot without demanding a lot of you. It lets you think. Python lets you think. And that, to me, uh, that is really it. When you're coding in Python, in, or when you're coding in many other languages, I feel like you're thinking a lot about programming. You're thinking a lot about the abstractions. And somehow, when you're coding in Python, you're actually thinking about the domain the whole time. And that, to me, is so special. And that's really the special thing about Python that I wanted 
to carry into Streamlit. And so, okay, what is Streamlit? Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, it's a way to turn Python scripts into interactive uh, web apps. And um, it's super easy to get started. Uh, you can pip install Streamlit, uh, and then you can type Streamlit hello, and it gets you started from there. Um, and uh, and then uh, it's based on very, very simple principles. And I really liked actually uh, the way Nicholas talked about the simple principles underlying um, uh, underlying plotly dash. Uh, and, and similarly for Streamlit, we try to really minimize what you have to think about. So the first one is just embrace Python scripting. So every Streamlit app is just a Python script. It is native Python. You can in fact Python it uh, and it'll run as an ordinary script. Uh, and also you could Streamlit run it and then it'll run as something visual. The second one is treat widgets as variables. So we just want you to inject wherever your script needs to sort of change or branch, you can just inject one line of code. You don't have to think about uh, sort of as an app developer, you think just as a Python programmer, as a data script developer. And the final one is uh, that we provide some primitives that let you reuse code over time. This is a little bit the way um, a, uh, I'm forgetting the word, but the way a cell works, I think that's the word, in, um, in, uh, in Jupyter. Um, and uh, it's super easy to add a whole bunch of other interesting, cool things. Uh, we've worked really hard, like Python itself, to make sure that Streamlit is completely batteries included. So out of the box, it works with all of the major, uh, you know, plotting libraries. And again, I have to say, you know, listening to this talk and listening to you guys all talk, uh, it's very inspirational to see how really this is actually just one community, and all these all these technologies are in, are interrelated so 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 deeply um and uh and uh finally you can really go crazy and connect these primitives away uh, together in a bunch of interesting ways and i'll talk a little bit more about that later uh over the past two months we've uh, released a whole bunch of amazing, fun things that make Streamlit more beautiful, uh, that let you uh, understand how to use it better, um, let developers and viewers interact with their apps differently. Uh, and also, I'm very excited to announce that next Tuesday, we're going to be launching Streamlit Cloud. So actually, Jim, I really appreciated the way you said, you know, all of these companies and projects are supported financially in different ways. And that's a really important part of the of the of the of the story. And I've really learned that that's true. You know, Streamlit started off um, actually as an open source project. It was not meant to be a company. And it, it became a company when we saw some engineers at Uber using it. And we were like, oh, wow, there could be something here. Um, the open source project is very, very dear to my heart. And um, uh, and uh, and so it's you know similar to Plotly, the project itself is 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 sort of independent of the company, and we support it as a community project. And also, we build a bunch of really cool tools to let you uh, uh, share your Streamlit apps and deploy them and do additional neat things on top. But the core Streamlit library is the same for everyone. Uh, and so I wanted to show you guys a quick demo of that. Uh, and so I must go back to the original uh, uh, demo that I shared at, uh, at PyData two years ago. This is it. Uh, it looks a little cooler now because we've added some cool stuff. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is grab this GitHub repo, and I'm going to go over to share.streamlets.io. Actually, you know, this will be more fun if we put them side by side. So let's do that. Uh, do, do. Okay. So here we have GitHub, uh, and here we have uh, Streamlit. And in fact, right now I'm in the uh, Streamlit uh, workspace. I'm going to switch over to my own workspace here. OK, so these are all my apps that I've been working on. I'm going to grab this uh, URL that you see here on the left, and I'm going to uh, let's create a new app. And let's paste uh, this URL. We can do some additional fancy stuff here, which I won't go into. Uh, we can deploy it. Uh, this time, it already had been deployed, so uh, so, uh, uh, so 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 it loaded really quickly. Otherwise, it has to build a container, but it takes it still quick. And so here we have a uh, you know the the the, the um, same sorry to, app. Sorry to interrupt, Adrian. Uh, just a reminder that we just have one more minute. 
Cool. Oh, okay, okay. Cool, cool, cool. Um, and this super cool stuff you can do here. So we can um, edit it, for example, in um, in your source repository. So I'm going to change like this this uh, this select box and turn it into a multi-select. So how would I do that? Do, 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 do. Um, so we go like this, come this out, and we'll commit this change. And there, it auto-reloaded the app. In fact, it kept the state, which is like really amazing. So now this multi-select is a uh, is a uh, is a it allows you to program the, the layout and, and super cool. Okay, um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm way behind schedule on this talk as it turns out. So I'm gonna go really quickly, and I'm going to say. Um, uh, this is just a really cool uh, technology. Uh, it's already being used in a ton of companies. It has security built in from the beginning. Uh, it lets you, you can work with all your single sign-on providers. Uh, we're working with the large cloud providers to provide streamlets to, uh, in, in, a, in a very secure way to connect to your data sources. So if that's something that's interesting to you, you should uh, contact us. Um, and so I think that, uh, you know, Python uh, lets you do a lot without demanding a lot of you. Uh, to me, that's really the, the flip side of simplicity is flow. It's the ability to build uh, a lot of not just one app and make it a huge, crazy project, but build a lot of things. And we've seen Fortune 50 companies uh, who have created like a thousand Streamlit apps uh, in production, all running simultaneously in the past year. Uh, running various aspects of their operations. So that's like super exciting. The other thing I want to tell you about in five seconds is community. Uh, this is uh, really important to us. It's a huge part of what makes it fun to work at Streamlit and be part of Streamlit. Uh, it, we really think about who we are in the world. These are our values, be kind, um, you know, which is not just be saccharine or, 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 or don't have candor. It means, you know, it means recognize the humanity in others. And I think that this actually plays out throughout the entire, uh, throughout everything that happens at Streamlit. So it's really fun to work here. Uh, you know, uh, we just had our offsite, uh, our yearly offsite in Colorado. And these are uh, many of the people who work at Streamlit. And uh, it's just, uh, I want to say shout out to all of them and say thank you uh, for, for working at Streamlit every day. It's really fun working with all of you. Uh, if you go to the gallery, you will see that... Um, uh, there is a huge community of people who are creating incredibly interesting things uh, in Streamlit, and it's quite inspirational. And you can see all kinds of uses in, for machine learning and for uh, more traditional, I suppose, dashboarding type applications. I'm not going to go into all of this stuff, uh, but really cool. Uh, you know, if you go into Twitter and you search for Streamlit, uh, similarly to Dash, you'll see uh, just incredible amounts of energy. I mean, this is it's just so, so, so cool. Uh, I don't even, can't even tell you this. I think, we're, you know, we're still October 25th. That's three days ago, and it just keeps going and going. Okay. Um, and, uh, oh, custom components, really, really cool. So um, this is just like allowing people to to create things, uh, you know, and and, and extend the value, the, the thing of Streamlit. Uh, here's a neat one that lets you uh, have a, a webcam component. Uh, this is a demo. You can also, we can start it right here. Uh, and uh, there we go. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, and you know, stop it and change things. So anyway, that's super cool to see the community also building a lot of interesting components for Streamlit. Um, and uh, oh, there's tons and tons of, uh, you know, contributors to Streamlit. Uh, and I want to thank all of them, over 180 uh, Streamlit. Um, so, oh, oh no, 118. Adrian, but yeah. if you don't um, mind. Oh, okay. Uh, I, may, I have, may I have 10 more seconds to share one more demo? Uh, uh, and so finally I'll say, hey, you can also, there's a ton of just Streamlit on, uh, uh, on GitHub. Um, and that I think is is really neat. Uh, uh, not only from the perspective of you know seventy six thousand uh, examples of import streamlit as is T. That's not. That's really neat. Not only from the perspective of there's a huge code examples to see how you can use streamlit in different ways, but it actually um, uh, it, it's so there's so much streamlit on uh, the online 
that in fact um, over half the Fortune 50 uses Streamlit. There's oh, there's a cool book about Streamlit <laughs> by a, by a, by a stream, by a data scientist. But anyway, I'll get to the whole point here, which is that there's so much Streamlit on GitHub at this point uh, that now uh, AIs have learned to speak Streamlit automatically. So this is a really mind-bending demo where someone says an app which shows price for Google stock. And then they say from Streamlit, import Streamlit as ST, import Yahoo Finance. And this entire app is written from scratch using Codex uh, uh, and, and generates a working Streamlit app that shows Google stock price. Really, this is, this is something that you can try yourselves. This is really, really stunning. So I will pause there. I'll, I will end there and say that the flip side of community is power. We think that all these things come together in a really interesting way in Streamlit. And so thank you so much for your time. And uh, sorry for going a bit over and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thanks a lot for all the cool stuff, Adrian. Um, now going back again to James for the discussion topics. Uh, all right, so that, that concludes the portion of this workshop where everyone gets to uh, present their own case for their own library, why it's interesting and exciting. And all of them are clearly interesting and exciting. Um, uh, but this is the, this last portion of it is really the unique feature of this workshop where you, you get to hear what each library thinks about each other, all the other <laughs> libraries and how they relate to each other. Um, and to start that off, I'd like each of the library authors to think of one good and nice thing to say about the, another library or all the other libraries if you want, um, but just something to point out that is a strength of one of the other, other libraries, something that, um, that that other library uh, does well. And so in, let me see what order, we were going this order, so I'll probably uh, go backwards order this time. Adrian, uh, you could have maybe uh, two minutes to say uh, that sort of thing. Two minutes. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, there's, there's, first of all, thank you for setting this up this way, Jim. It's really cool. And I do think that like the larger picture of the Python data ecosystem being something that we're all part of and trying to grow and it's strong is, I just love that framing. So um, I, was, I mean, where, where to start, uh, you know, uh, voila, I think is a very beautiful way of connecting, uh, of, of extending the story of Jupiter into, uh, into this dashboarding framework. And of really connecting that story, uh, and you know, it, I think it makes a lot of sense if you're working in a Jupyter notebook to to create things in Voila. I also just want to say, you know, obviously Jupyter uh, itself is is basically a stunning uh, advancement in scientific community in computing, and we we probably all wouldn't be here if not for Jupyter. So, uh, shout out to that community and 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 the Jupyter folks. Um, you know, uh, very cool. Uh, I guess I'll say something about all of them. Uh, very cool. Um, uh, uh, um, sorry, I'm blanking all the names. Uh, Plotly Dash uh, demo uh, where you know the, the reactivity uh, going back to Python is is really uh, is really stunning, and I think that the the sort of basic set of abstractions that you guys have uh, put together make a lot of sense and hold well together. Uh, and then finally, um, uh, for a panel, uh, I think you know obviously a great deal of work has gone into uh, visualizing large data sets and uh, and also uh, creating real-time dashboards, which I don't think you showed, Mark, but it's something that's really neat about panels. So, uh, you know, all it, it, I'm struck in many ways by the commonalities among these projects, so I'm there. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, Sylvain? Hey, um, yeah, so I, I don't, I didn't really know Streamlit so well, but I think this demo by Adrien was absolutely stunning. So uh, um, every time I've seen examples of Streamlit, it, it seemed, and it's obviously so polished and you know, well finished that, you know, it's, it's, it seems to be a very impressive framework. Uh, regarding Dash, I think we've looked a lot into Dash recently, uh, specifically with respect to scalability and, you know, because they have a so different model, like execution model from Voila and, and we, we were like trying to think of, you know, what we could, you know, do to be closer to Dash's uh, scalability. So that's definitely, and, and like we're, we're obviously good friends with the Plotly folks and who are building upon API widgets for, for the library as well. So uh, clearly, yeah, I would say Dash's uh, scalability is what we're, what is really striking. 
And um, regarding panel, so it's really funny because I think the first panel release was announced at the same Jupyter Community Workshop as Voila. Uh, so Philip uh, was attending, and we both announced the first release in the same in the same at the same event. Um, and uh, and so yeah, I mean, a panel is sort of the natural, uh, you know, top layer on top of. You know the whole of this framework and like all of that stack, and so it, it makes a lot of sense for building applications with, with you know with large amounts of data. So, yeah, that's it. All right, thank you, uh, Mark. Yes, thanks. So there's a lot of good things to say, but if I should say one thing, so for for Streamlit, it's really if you have one function and you want to make it interactive, it's really easy with Streamlit. And for Walla, well, Walla just provides what the Jupyter users they they need and crave and and so on. It it really provides something for that community that fits really well in there. And then I would say for for a Dash, well, Dash really it speaks the language language of enterprise, you could say, and it's really good at that. All right, and uh, Nicholas. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, I love this part. Uh, I, so, so Streamlit, I just think that the developer extreme, uh, experience of, of writing a Streamlit app is, app is just lovely. Like, it's so fluent, um, and the, the automated caching uh, mechanism is, is great and something I'm very jealous of. Uh, so you guys have done a, a, an incredible job of, of sort of like bridging that gap. Um, for Voila, I actually think it's, it's sort of similar. Uh, the thing I really love about Voila is um, uh, if, you, if you came to my, my talk earlier today, uh, I'm, I really care a lot about uh, data scientists being able to build their own tools really quickly. Uh, data scientists spend a lot of their time in Jupyter, um, and I just love the fact that you're just like in Jupyter and then and then you're you're in Voila. Um, so that that, that 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 like no extra step uh, aspect of it uh, really really seals the deal for me, and I, I love Voila for that. Um, and and the fact that it's um, you know uh, like like totally open source. Um, uh, and, and part of the ecosystem. Um, anyway, it's it's great. Um, and panel, I I'm I'm always very impressed with the uh, the sort of scope of vision and, and sort of unifying concepts uh, that that the Holoviz community uh, comes out with. Um, you know, to have the, the whole like there's some beautiful diagrams uh, on their website of like kind of the vision of uh, everything to do with with, with computation and viz uh, and and Holoviz and HGplot and how they connect to every other part of the of the ecosystem. Um, and uh, and that's that's just like a real strength uh, of uh, of what Panel and Holoviz do. So, um, you know, thank you all for for everything that you do for this community. Um, and it's something that I look I look, kind of look over the fence sometimes at other communities and they have this kind of monoculture of everyone uses the one library. Um, and people think that we here in, in Python are a little like fragmented and weird, and people can't just decide. But um, this is a huge strength <laughs> of our community is that we have so many amazing options and people working together and, and interoperating. So, thanks. Very cool. Okay, uh, thank you. All those are really insightful comments, and I'm actually going to read the uh, listen to the recording later and kind of uh, think about each one of them. Those are those are really helpful. Thanks, everybody. Um, I collected some votes for discussion topics from the um, uh, Slack channel, and uh, there were two votes each for numbers three and four. So let's go ahead and start with those. Um, number three. Uh, if each author could sort of just say uh, very succinctly, uh, what does your library offer so for exporting to a standalone HTML page that you could send in an email or provide to somebody who doesn't have Python running? So uh, go back to the original order. So uh, Nicholas. Uh Good question. So any given, uh, certainly Plotly figure can be exported to HTML. Uh, a Dash application uh, does not does not have a sort of obvious way of doing that. Um, within Dash Enterprise, it's possible to export to PDF pretty easily, um, but that's uh, that's something where we don't um, sort of architecture a little bit challenging, right? The, the main purpose of Dash is to connect the UI to a Python function. So without the Python piece, there's not a whole lot that we can do. Okay, thanks, uh, Mark. Yeah. So uh, I think this is where Panel has something unique. You can think about video recording, actually. That's what Panel can do. So if you have an interactive application running on a server, then uh, it can actually like run through all the combinations of sliders or widgets or something like, like that, at least to a limit, and sort of record the application. And then you have a static uh, 
HTML application you can uh, share with a colleague via an email or Slack or something like that. Cool. Uh, so then. Uh, yeah, so the answer for Vola is that for this purpose, we use the, the other tools from the Jupyter stack and specifically NB Convert. The latest release of NB Convert includes a tool called Deja Vu, which is another you know part of my plot to uh, force Americans to type accents. And mm -hmm. uh, so Deja Vu turns uh, notebooks into HTML or PDFs through a, a headless browser and can apply, it has the same basic and default uh, options as Vola, and it can apply Vola templates. So if you type Deja Vu in Notebook, or if you use the, the, the NB Convert endpoint in JupyterLab, you get the PDF corresponding to your Vola dashboard, or HTML, depending on what you want. Cool, Adrian? Uh, so, uh, so Streamlit doesn't have an export to HTML feature. Uh, we actually originally did, uh, but uh, we we got rid of it and really focused on um, on making Streamlit apps extremely shareable. So the example that I showed you uh, was you click to deploy, and then uh, this a URL is given to you that you can share anywhere in the world. Uh, and Streamlit Cloud, which is coming up next Tuesday, it's been in beta with about six hundred companies, uh, is uh, about making that possible inside of work. Organizations, so we really focus on uh, creating interactive artifacts, and then we want to make it a really beautiful, shareable experience to pass those artifacts around securely in an organization or with the whole world. All right. Well, thanks for that sort of segue into number four. Uh, so maybe uh, just <laughs> one little quick uh, distinction between number four and five. If each of you could talk about four, but compare it to five, the difference between deploying one of your apps. For all the world to see, or deploying behind a firewall. I'll just we'll just keep rotating, I guess. Um, so uh, Dash is built on Flask. Uh, Flask is pretty easy to deploy. Uh, folks deploy uh, Dash applications publicly on Heroku all the time. Uh, you can do it for, I believe, free or, or small dollar amounts. Um, we do not today have a uh, plately hosted kind of shiny apps type thing or uh, or Streamlit share system, although we're we're thinking about it. Um, Beyond Heroku, you can deploy it on basically you know any of the recipes that exist to deploy a, a Flask app on like DigitalOcean or, or anything else. Um, that broadly holds for internal systems as well. You can deploy a Dash application uh, any, anywhere you like, and of course for internal systems, uh, we love it if you if you license Dash Enterprise to do that, which is a, a whole set of tools um, that uh, allow you to control who can who can access your Dash apps. Um, so you can use that both publicly or internally if you want. Although the majority of our customers do so internally. So uh, yeah, again, you can uh, deploy almost anywhere, but not on Python anywhere because they don't support WebSockets. And one of the unique things about Panel is actually that you don't have to buy an enterprise uh, subscription or whatever to get authentication. It's built into Panel. Yeah, so you, Voila really uses the Jupyter stack uh, for that purpose as well. So we document deploying Voila specifically uh, on top of a running Jupyter Hub instance or on Heroku or even on Binder. Uh, so if you need some uh, specific uh, single sign-on uh, plugin, you can just use the corresponding JupyterHub plugin for Voila. Okay, and Adrian? Uh, so are we, are we, I'll, I'm just gonna perhaps combine four and five. Yes, please. So, yes, please. okay, cool. So, um, so yeah, so Streamlit has a uh, public uh, sharing uh, uh, service called share.streamlit.io. Um, we've just uh, really uh, lifted the cap on the number of public apps that you can share. It used to be three, now it's infinity. Um, that's because we had a, actually the, the head of, uh, of, uh, of platform development at Heroku joined Streamlit a, a, a year and a half ago and has helped us really build a scalable system for sharing apps. So that's pretty exciting. Um, right now, there are uh, over 30,000 apps uh, shared and Streamlit apps are going to be viewed 1.5 million times this quarter. So we're really excited about that. Uh, and then... Um, the, the same technology is used uh, in Streamlit Cloud to allow companies to securely share apps with one another. Um, we have a bunch of additional technology that lets you do secure connection to data sources and so forth. It is a SaaS service, so that is a, the security model that we offer. Um, in addition, uh, yeah, Streamlit can be deployed uh, you know, in Heroku and all these other things. If you go to our docs, we, have, we encourage that usage. We show you how to put it on GCP, on Amazon, on Heroku, on uh, wherever DigitalOcean, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, a lot of 
uh, big companies uh, have actually created their own streamlet, uh, uh, basically su- systems inside uh, the company. So, uh, you know, famously uh, Uber, famously for us, Uber created uh, added streamlet to their data science workbench, which is a lot, you know, allows all uh, employees to to deploy streamlit apps. And so, um, what we do is, um, you know, for large companies like that. At present, streamlet sharing uh, is usually not the right solution for security reasons, and then we uh, help them create their own streamlet deploy. Uh, so that's the uh, internal to their uh, VPC or or on-prem. Okay, thank you very much. All right, we've got um, two more that have uh, vo- two votes. That's seven and twenty. So um, seven. How much do you have to know web technologies, JavaScript or HTML? And I guess if you want, you can contrast it with number nine, which is that if you do know of these things, how easily can you um, can you customize and get into the nitty gritty? So maybe go back and forth between those two. Do you have to know? And can you use it if you do know? So again, let's just keep the same order. It makes it so much easier. So uh, Nicholas. Yeah, sure thing. So um, given the Dash is based on, <clears throat> on React, uh, you can use any React component that exists it's been wrapped in, in Dash. Um, do you, you, so you don't have to know any JavaScript uh, to, use, to use Dash components. If you do know JavaScript, you can either build your own components or wrap existing components. Um, do you need to know HTML and CSS? You don't need to. You can use a component suite like Dash Bootstrap components uh, that lets you kind of work at a slightly higher level. Uh, if you have uh, a preferred sort of framework for doing stuff, you can either find or build uh, a set of components that use it. Um, but if you do know HTML and CSS, uh, you can you can use you know HTML.div and P and span and all the CSS stuff you want. Uh, so we, we really do try and give you access to the to the full um, the full breadth of the stack. Um, and and you know I, I showed a bunch of different apps that really did have quite different looks and feels. <laughs> um, and, and and most of those apps actually that I showed were uh, were built by uh, not by Plotly employees. Like these are apps that that you know folks have successfully and, and happily built. So um, we like we like the balance that we're we're striking there. Thank you, um, Mark. Yes. So uh, as a beginner, you don't need to know anything about uh, JavaScript, HTML, or CSS. For yeah, that's that's what we want to provide with panel. But we all we also want you to not meet dead ends. So if you have friend, friends, colleagues, some something like that, you can call in a rock star front end developer. Then you can use uh, JavaScript, HTML, and CSS uh, to build custom components with JavaScript or TypeScript, React, uh, web components, whatever. OK, thanks. Uh, so bad. Yeah, uh, you, you don't need to know any JavaScript or CSS or HTML to write a Voila notebook, because you just need to know how to make a notebook. Uh, however, if you do, uh, then you can create new Jupyter widgets very easily, so which are the equivalent of panel components, I would say. and Another thing that you can do if you are uh, proficient in front-end development is create a new Voila template. For example, you could make a template for your company that has the logo of your company, some bottle plate, uh, you know, legalese at the bottom, that, that, that type of stuff. Cool. Uh, Adrian. Uh, yeah, so uh, similar story. Uh, you don't need to know stream, uh, you don't need to know uh, HTML and CSS. Uh, we try to make uh, sort of the basic components that you'd want to use to make an app uh, available and super easy to use. Um, that's part of the point. Uh, you can use, uh, you, we are also based on React. Uh, so that's the simplest uh, uh, thing to use, but we also allow custom components to iframe in anything they want. And that allows you to use Vue. Uh, people have used Elm. Um, to create components for a streamlet. Uh, and that's how, for example, the webcam components that I showed you earlier, and of course, uh, was created. And of course, you know, this uh, streamlet's emphasis on community means that we also uh, really have an active community around building components and sharing uh, other kinds of uh, bits of snippets of, of code online. And so if you go to streamlet.io slash components, uh, you can see uh, lots of examples of, um, of interesting components. Also, Mark runs awesome streamlet, which is a great way to find out other cool examples of streamlet use uh, and components. Very cool. OK, so looks like 20 has a lot of lists. Uh, OK, applications. This is uh, suggested by Nicholas, actually. So Nicholas, uh, application that Library X is not suitable for. Yeah. Um, 
so so it's painful to to talk about this. No, um, so you know we we would like Dash to be to be uh, really suitable for for everything else for everything. Uh, I would say that that where Dash is probably weakest right now, and this maybe connects to to twelve here, is sort of the the experience of sort of starting in a notebook and moving to an app. Um, and so if you if you have something built in a notebook with IPy widgets, um, you built yourself a, a small tool and you want to kind of like switch to or upgrade to being to building a a, a richer app. Um, uh, and you want to do so with Dash, that's that's more difficult. Uh, and I would say the sort of activation energy to kind of jump out of your your notebook flow, if that's where you're at, uh, to to start building an, uh, a Dash app is probably the, the the biggest impediment to using Dash right now. Um, so so I would say it's not use it's not so suitable for building yourself like a one off little tool uh, when you're when you're in your notebook flow. Cool, Mark. Sorry, I didn't hear the question. What is panel not really suitable for compared to these other tools? Yeah, so sometimes people, they ask me, should I build a SaaS application and earn money on it and have a lot of customers? And that's not really what it's for. It's like for <laughs> super user tools inside an enterprise, inside a university, inside a, an organization, I would say. OK. Uh, so then? Yeah, I, th I think uh, the the answer also applies to to voila. Uh, voila really only scales as much as you can provide compute environments for each user, and you have very you know it's a, it's it's an embarrassingly part of a problem. So you can certainly scan it up, you know, by spawning more uh, pods in the Kubernetes cluster, that type of stuff. But um, it's really the opposite model to Dash, which is like completely stateless and is really based on a normal, you know, web server that you can, you know, uh, I guess uh, put behind the load balancer that, or that type of stuff. So really, there there is a limit to the scale that you can, you know, deploy voila dashboards. Well, oh, and Adrian. Um... Uh, yeah, so <laughs> uh, there's there's many ways of answering this question. Um, uh, I, I think it, one way that I was just thinking of is um, if you if you go to uh, roadmap.streamlet.io or tear.streamlet.io slash streamlet slash roadmap, uh, you can see sort of all the things that we're working on. And in many ways, that's kind of um, a picture of, of where we'd like the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the app to go. Um, and so what, I'm just looking at this right now. We're working on um, workspace invitations, multi-page apps, custom subdomains per app, um, uh, ability to set up third-party analytics, uh, st.user, which is the ability to sort of tie user identity into various aspects of your app, st.database, a tiny NoSQL database for every app in Streamlit Cloud. By the way, this is none of this is secret. You can see this all online. Uh, drawable Canvas widget. Uh, anchors everywhere, tabs container, pop-up containers. Um, so uh, lots and lots of cool things coming down the line. And each one of the, the lack of each one of those is, is certainly a painful to us, uh, but we're excited to be bringing them to you all in the coming months. Okay, thank you. Um, it looks like there was confusion about between 11 and 12 bef uh, on the chat, I see. But uh, in any case, I think 12 has been covered by, some, by each of the uh, discussions. So how about number 11? Some of the votes for 12 for, were apparently for number 11. So how good is your app framework at com creating complex apps that have multi-page uh, or involved some form of state, particularly state between multiple pages, that sort of thing? So uh, Nicholas? Yeah, um, so I think it's it's really important to to highlight with Dash. So we have a stateless architecture, uh, and that is stateless sort of from the point of view of the server. That's a kind of very low level technical detail. But um, Dash is actually extremely well suited to building sort of very complex um, complex applications. So multi page is pretty easy. There's a Dash component for the the location. People do this all the time. Um, that that one uh, video that I showed like two seconds of, um, I encourage people to watch it because it's it's pretty impressive. So folks are building. Uh, quite powerful, you know, multi-stage tools uh, out of Dash, where you know either you upload a file, you run some process, you use to give some more user input, drag things around. Um, uh, so, so Dash is actually pretty good at that, um, and the the complexity doesn't scale too too badly. Like it's not your app doesn't like explode in complexity when you when you build this. The the reactive model, uh, and the the stateless sort of pure functional model scales really, really well with that. You can break your app up into little little files, have separate little functions, unit test them uh, and decorate them. Um, and so that's, I feel like one of the real strengths of Dash. Cool, Mark? Yeah, so I feel like multi-page apps, 
that's really a strength of panel. It's really coming out of, you can just have individual files, each of them are an app, and then you serve them up and they are sort of connected. So that's really a, a strength. And then you can say the architecture of, yeah, panel and Streamlit and Walla is the opposite of Dash, right? It's, it has state. For panel, we have session state. So the individual user can have like that, the state of a data frame or something, uh, or a plot. But you can also share state across uh, sessions. So if you have like, an, uh, you're loading expensive data or something, you can, you can do it once and then you can share it with uh, across users. Cool, so that. Yeah, uh, sorry, I was looking for the unmute button. So yeah, Voila is a stateful uh, application. So it depends on where the complexity is, I would say. Uh, if you have a very complex model in the backend that requires a lot of data, you can certainly do that with, with Voila easily. Uh, then in terms of the complexity of the front end, like multi-page, whatever, it all is limited by the widget framework that you decide to use. You could use like advanced ones like App Beautify and the, which are mobile friendly. If you just use the basic App widget control, you can only go so far, you know, because you, you know, then in order to make complex layouts, you need to start uh, using, you know, nested widgets and edge boxes and V boxes, which, which can, you know, only go so far when you, you know, if you really want to have something like a, I don't know, a neutral nuclear plant control panel, that's, that may not be the best tool. So then I think you need to use a, like a more of a really good widget framework to build this kind of application with Vola. Okay, Adrian. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, our customers do create very complex multi-page apps in Streamlit. Uh, they also create stateful apps as described in a number of ways. Uh, we took a very long time to release uh, our own first party uh, state um, abstractions in Streamlit. And the reason is because uh, I guess perhaps to a fault, we're obsessed with uh, just the simplicity of the of the uh, UI and the uh, and the uh, the developer experience. Uh, we haven't yet released a first party way of creating multi page apps. Um, they're certainly uh, creatable. I'm looking at our own internal app dashboard right now, which is a multi page app, and we have uh, we we can point to many examples at big companies. Uh, but we're working on trying to really bring uh, an API that we think. Uh, expresses that idea of multi-page apps and also sort of multi-function computation um, in a way that's super uh, easy for the developer and just as importantly, super understandable and consumable for the viewer. Very cool. Okay, it looks like the next most common is 14 rendering large data sets. Nicholas. Yeah. Um... I would say that 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 sort of just works. Like Dash doesn't really have a, a whole lot to say about about the size of the data that you're that you're running. Uh, it's mostly kind of the conduit for that. So um, people use uh, people use Dash to to front extremely large data sets. You know, uh, connecting to upstream servers like I don't know Snowflake, Databricks, Rapids, um, Dask, and so on. Um, and we interoperate really well with um, with stuff like data shader and hollow views. So there's not really anything in the way of you using uh, the usual the usual uh, Python suspects. Um, I, li I linked to that one app that has a you know a data shader overlay on a map uh, and, a, and a Dask backend um, at the NVIDIA uh, GTC keynote a couple of years ago, a year ago. It's been a long pandemic. Um, <laughs> they talked about using uh, using Rapids and Dash uh, to to sort of back uh, real time COVID infection data. Um, so yeah, the Dash is sort of just Python um, and, and you can use all the usual suspects for, for large data sets. Sounds good, Mark. Yeah, so I would say Panel and Holovis is really driving the big data visualizations via data shader and other stuff. So um, yes, you can. And especially I also think the actually the that you have state in your application makes it sort of easier to make uh, interactive uh, big data visualizations. Okay, so that? Um, yeah, <laughs> once again, I think I'll give the same answer. It's very orthogonal oh. to Voila. The size of the data is really orthogonal to, to, to how Voila works. Voila has been used in combination with uh, tools such as Holovase or VEX, for example, for actually doing some data decimation for plotting and whatnot, and just like you can do in the notebook. Cool. All right, Adrian. Um, 
I'll I'll be a little bit uh, controversial and say that um, while I do think that the size of the data uh, sources are in a sense orthogonal to these frameworks, um, I, it's 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 easy to say uh, you know you can't necessarily hold a you know terabyte data frame in memory, for example. Uh, and it's easy to say, oh, well, it's Python, it's all programmable, so therefore it all works for large data frames because you can always do something in Python that fixes that. I think that's true, and that's certainly true of Streamlit as well. Uh, but uh, you know, in terms of uh, built-in basic primitives to do those kinds of things, uh, you know, uh, Streamlit uh, and, and actually I think many of these other frameworks, with perhaps the exception of Panel, I'm, I'm not sure how that works, uh, are are actually really not designed for for giant data sets, and they have to be sort of wired together with uh, on top of Spark or other things in order to make that possible. Uh, that's certainly true with Streamlit as well. Um, I I would also say that a, a a minor but kind of cool thing about Streamlit is that because it the the basic framework is that you're running a um, a, a script. And scripts themselves are designed to work on, you know, arbitrarily long computation. Uh, uh, Streamlit was really designed to make it possible to create uh, progress bars and other kinds of things that sort of show you the the progress of, of, of a long computation as it's happening. Um, and that's something that uh, that that's one way, and perhaps a slightly non-trivial way, in which we make it slightly easier to work with large data sets. <laughs> Okay, looks like we have time for one more question and then man, and maybe a last statement from each of the libraries about uh, things that you've learned. So um, well, why don't you go ahead and combine them because number 19 is the next one in votes and it's uh, intended slash mainline application for X. Like what is the prototypical reason somebody would use this library? And so if each of the um, participants could have, let's see, we have seven minutes, so two minutes apiece uh, to talk about that for each for your library, what is this really for? And anything else you want to throw in in that two minutes? Uh, Nicholas, go. Yeah, for sure. Uh, there's a question about accessibility, which I think is really important. So I'll, I'll, I'll spend 30 seconds on it. So accessibility uh, in terms of sort of keyboard navigation um, and an ARIA tags and, and readability um, is something that is primarily driven by the, by the component layer and the front end layer. Um, so I will say that within Dash, uh, our built-in components uh, are not particularly accessible, and it's something that we'd like to work on, and we, we'd love some help with, um, and that uh, uh, custom components that are built, sort of the accessibility thereof, um, depends on depends on the custom component. So that's not something that that we do an amazing job at, but we would uh, we would love to learn more about how to do that. Um, the intended mainline application for Dash, I would say, is basically, um, you know, I, I kind of think about it as the last mile in some ways to uh, to data science projects is to is to pr provide a user interface and a way for humans to connect with data and models. Um, so be that, you know, kind of a read-only interface to sort of do data exploration or um, a sort of bridge to connect the work of data scientists and non-data scientists, uh, you know, people who have access to Python code um, and, you know, sort of giving their output uh, or bringing people in who, who have expertise about a particular domain um, uh, to, to, to bear and to, to sort of work with Python code. So that's, that's sort of the, the, the high-level mainline application for, uh, for Dash. Um, sure. And... Um, by, by way of closing, like this has been a, a really fun session. It's been really nice to have everyone sort of side by side and be able to kind of let everyone uh, uh, speak for themselves. So thank you. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, so the intended or mainline application for a panel is probably like domain application, just as before. Like if you are a scientist, you want to make something for yourself, something for your colleague, something for your stakeholders, your manager. Maybe something for a customer. I also see uh, people coming out of CERN, uh, working with big data, making aviation tracking applications or stuff like that. So, yes. Cool, thanks. So that? Uh, yeah, um, I would say that um, the main use case for Vola is if you have, for example, a team of data scientists who are using Jupyter and know how to make nice Jupyter notebooks, they don't have to learn anything new. They can just turn these notebooks into Vola dashboards. If they want to apply a template with the company, you know, um, visual identity, and you can easily, you know, share such Vola dashboards uh, with the users of a Jupyter Hub. Um, deployment. So this is, you know, really, you don't need to know that you're making a dashboard in order to make a dashboard. So that's really the main thing. And in the future, I mean, it's going to be even easier. Jup Jupyter is really making strides in with respect to social features, uh, like co collaborative editing, just sending to Jupyter Lab. And now we are going to have 
like an experience that's really closer to like Google Docs or that type of stuff. And within that framework where you can really have like collaborative um, environments, uh, I think that Voila is going to become even more like easy to use and easy to uh, like an, an even better tool for sharing information within a team or a company. Cool, thanks. Uh, Adrian. Um, uh, similar to, to what uh, the others have said here, you know, uh, Streamlit is a superpower which lets data scientists um, build apps without uh, needing to know uh, really anything beyond the Python stack. Uh, I think the thing that where we really shine and where we've really put a lot of focus in, and it's a sort of a thread through all the demos I showed you, was we really wanted to make it possible to create apps so quickly and to iterate that on them so quickly. This is something that, and therefore to not view apps as a sort of rarefied thing that you do every now and then, but rather as a sort of byproduct of the data science workflow that you just have a thousand apps, why not? 10,000 apps. Uh, and so uh, that's something that we both are seeing internally at Streamlit actually. Um, you know, th there's a problem with this data source. Oh, here's an app that lets you introspect that data source and find all of the mistakes. And I just created it in half an hour and I just shared it with you. And by the way, by the end of the day, we're not gonna need it anymore. The app's gone. Um, that's just super cool. And, uh, and, and then make them extremely shareable and extremely usable by others inside of the organization. And so, uh, yeah, we are seeing with a big automaker, you know, for the first year it was, you know, five apps and then it was 30 apps and now it's a thousand apps. And so that, that sort of, suddenly it's Cambrian explosion of building apps really quickly, iterating on them super quickly, fixing the code during the meeting and, and having it update live. That's what we're really focused on. Very cool. Okay, well, I'd really like to thank all of the uh, panelists for such insightful comments about your own libraries and everyone else's. That was really helpful. And thank you to the audience for the uh, questions that you uh, piped in there and for your uh, supportive comments in the chat. That's been really helpful. And thank you to the moderator and to PyData at, in general for hosting this and uh, setting this all up. It's been a great experience. Thank you. Thank you so much. James. Thanks, James. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, all. Thank you, everyone.